Good afternoon, uh, good day, good morning, wherever you are in the world. And thank you for joining us for our webinar today, the Oxford Internet Institute at 20, which celebrates 20 years of the department, featuring previous directors of the OII, Professor Philip Howard, Professor Helen Margetts, Professor William Dutton, Dr. Andrew Graham, all hosted by our current director, Professor Victoria Nash. A little housekeeping, we are fortunate to have a varied audience with a wide range of views, and we request that the opinions of others are respected in this space. For your awareness, this event is being recorded and will be posted on our website following the event. You can pose any question using the Q&A tab at any time, and these will be answered towards the end of the talk. Please try and keep questions as concise as possible. The questions will be visible to all attendees and can be upvoted and commented upon, and we will endeavour to follow up on any unanswered queries. Please allow me to introduce Vicky Nash. Isabel, thank you so much for the opportunity to host this event today. Uh, I am particularly delighted because I've been at the OII since uh, 2002 myself, starting in a very lowly position and then most recently reaching the, the, the sort of the great heights of becoming the new director. And the people that we have on our panel today have each in their turn shaped the department to an extraordinary extent and obviously also served as very familiar faces for many of those in the audience who've participated with us as students, uh, as guests at events, as peers. Um, so we welcome you all today in this birthday celebration. Um, I am also uh, particularly keen, I suppose, just as a remind ourselves of where we started. So back in 2001, the idea for us as a research institute was uh, you know, seemingly quite radical, and I think we forget about this sometimes. Um, Andrew Graham, I think we'll say a bit more about our founding at various points this evening, uh, but, but sort of came up with this rather wonderful idea along with uh, Derek Wyatt, uh, then an MP, Colin Lucas, uh, and, and also with the help of our wonderful founding donor, Dave Stephanie Shirley, who I think is also on the call tonight. And the idea was really to create an institute which was not your classic ivory tower department, Yes, in the sense that it was presenting wonderful research uh, and really operating, if you like, at the forefront of, the, of this new field, but not an ivory tower in the extent that from the very beginning it was intended to be outward looking and full of public good impact. Um, so I think, you know, it's useful to bear that in mind, perhaps, as we have this conversation tonight and reflect back on everything we've achieved over the last 20 years. Um, with that, let's introduce our panel. I'm going to note, Isabel, my camera doesn't seem to be showing up. It is on, um, but maybe it's just not visible at the moment. Um, our first panellist this evening, rather wonderfully, we're going to go in chronological order, uh, is Andrew Graham. So Andrew Graham, if you like, was uh, the driving force behind establishing the OII when he was Master of Balliol College, and he was our acting director from until July 2002. He then went on to found our advisory board. Uh, he served as chairman of that until 2011. He was a fellow in economics at Balliol, um, but he also served as an advisor to two UK prime ministers and a shadow chancellor. He did research at MIT on the rather wonderful concept, which now seems so dated, uh, of the information superhighway uh, and has conducted much of his later research on issues around public service broadcasting, a role in which he continues to advise. He's currently executive chair of the European, a network of 17 of Europe's leading universities, where he set up a new scholarship programme. Our second panellist is Bill Dutton. Uh, who came in as our founding director uh, in 2002. He joined us from the uh, University of Southern California, where he's an emeritus professor, and he was our director until 2011. His capacity for institution building continued when he left Oxford in 2014 to become uh, the uh, director of the Coelho Center at Michigan State University, and he's recently returned to Oxford as an Oxford Martin Fellow to support research on cybersecurity as well as having authored numerous seminal books and articles on the implications of digital technologies, his most recent work on the internet as a fifth estate, I think has been particularly provocative. Helen Margetts uh, is Professor of Society and the Internet and a Professorial Fellow at Mansfield College. She is a political scientist specialising in the relationship between digital technologies and government and politics and public policy. Uh, like our, our, our other panellists, she's published uh, so many books, articles and policy reports, including uh, one that, that again made waves in recent years on political turbulence, looking at how social media shaped collective action. Since 2018, when she stepped down as director, she's been director of the public policy programme at the Alan Turing Institute, which is the UK's National Institute for Data Science and AI. And we were very thrilled in 2019 when she was awarded an OBE for services to social and political science. 
Last but very much not least uh, is the excellent Phil Howard, who is the second professor of internet studies, Bill was the first, at Balliol College and the University of Oxford, and our most recent director. Phil's work has been involved in investigating the impact of digital media on political life, and most recently, the, the, the extent and impact of disinformation and propaganda on key public good issues like democracy, elections, and public health. Um, he's been a very frequent commentator on these issues, a lot of work that he's conducted, he has done in a way that it can have an impact in real time. Uh, and his, uh, his books and essays, again, have very much sort of driven research in this field, most recently with computational propaganda, political parties, politicians and manipulation on social media. And he was awarded the National Democratic Institute's 2018 Democracy Prize. Those are our wonderful panelists. And I would like now to turn to maybe each of them in turn, just to ask a couple of questions which might serve as additional but more personal forms of introduction. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, I am going to turn, again, let's deal with this chronologically. Let's start with Andrew first. So Andrew, you were um, obviously our very first founding director. Um, I'd love it if you could tell us a, found, a fun fact about the OI's founding. So something that astounded you at the time uh, maybe you know something that made, meant the institute nearly didn't arise. Uh, something that 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 was sort of politically very uh, indiscreet, but not so indiscreet. You can't tell us. But yes, tell us tell us something that that not many people know about the OI's founding. Um, I could pick two two things. One turned out to be trivial, and the other was also not sig that significant, but did rather matter. The first was uh, the general sense with some people in Oxford. Uh, why on earth was one doing this? I mean, it was just a deep sense of puzzlement. Back then, people, so to speak, hadn't got it. And I remember in particular being quizzed by a research committee of the Social Studies Board. Um, and somebody said, but we never had a telephone institute. Why should we have an internet institute? Um, and I managed to get rid of that question. That was the small scale thing. The bigger one was um, there was a long drawn out process. It actually only took in total nine months, but Dame Stephanie, if she's on the call, will remember that uh, in the meeting that I had with her, she basically said, Andrew, if you're going to get this done, you've got to get do the following. You've got to match the grant that I'm going to give you, which was a promise of 10 million. You've got to do it in less than six months. It took nine. And you've got to do it without my name being mentioned. Um, and um, these were quite challenging circumstances. Um, and we went through a long process in which we were finally getting towards getting a promise from the government. And we had a promise from the government, but not in writing, that via HEFKE, they would provide us funding of 5 million for the first five years and some follow-on funding for the second five years. So we had the matching. And then the letter from the then Secretary of State, David Blunkett, arrived with the Vice Chancellor which said the money for the first five years would be 2.5 million, not 5 million. Um, I had the great advantage that I had back in, when I was in short trousers, I'd worked in government. Um, and so I knew that the thing to do was to ring up the private office of the Secretary of State and just point out that they'd made a mistake. But it was a slightly worrying phone call when you got a letter from the Secretary of State promising you one number, which is significantly at odds with everything that's been said to you in phone calls and emails. It, I didn't have it in an email, just in phone calls. So anyway, that, that came about. If anybody's interested in following all this amusing story, uh, somewhere on the in the OII website, there is a, a, a history that I've written. And I've read, I can't think of anything that I didn't put into the history that would, would be funny. You say that, Andrew, but I always thought that history that you wrote, it was just so wonderfully frank. Um, it really was written in the style of a sort of political memoir. So no, I would advise people read that. It might raise some eyebrows, actually. Um, thank you for that little insight. And yeah, I mean, again, it just makes me realise how grateful we are that you had that political contact uh, and that political acumen to be able to go in and resolve that problem. Um, or maybe we wouldn't be here. Um, maybe let's move on to Bill next. Uh, so Bill, you came in in, I think, 2002, wasn't it? Just before I arrived. Um, really very much you know, tasked with, 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 the, with the sort of business of building this, this department, building this institute. Can you, can you tell us a little bit more about how you approached that? What were, your, what were your goals, your expectations, or your principles? Tell us a little bit about that. And I think you're still on mute, Bill. 
Yes, uh, happy to. Uh, I build on the, the radical nature of the Institute and also uh, Andrew's notion of why are we doing this? Uh, it was worse than that. It was when I got when I got there, I, it was clear when I was interviewed and also afterwards that uh, very few people at Oxford knew what in, what in the world an Internet Institute would do and what it, what it was and why and so forth. So one thing you have to understand, I think uh, every, all of the people in this panel understand this, but many others don't, is that Oxford was a greenfield in this area. There was no media studies department. There was no communication school. There was no information school. So we had a greenfield and, and we could do something that no other university had ever done. And um, I had been trying for over a decade to try to create a center in the US that was anchored in the social sciences. And every time you suggest this to social scientists in the US back in the 1990s, um, they'd say, go talk to the Dean of Engineering, go talk to computer science and so forth. But uh, Andrew and his, co and his many colleagues on the strategy committee and the, uh, through a variety of, you know, I, I don't know how much uh, strate strategy was in the idea of, of uh, embedding this in the social sciences, in the social sciences division. I think this was brilliant. It made us world leading in this area. No one just thought this could be done, but it was obviously critical to the way enabling us to have a mission that looked at the social implications of the internet in a way uh, that would inform policy and debate about the internet in society. And of course, Britain is the right place to do this. Britain has always had much more of a concern about the social implications of communication and media policy generally. But at Oxford, we had uh, placed this in, in the social sciences. So our strategy was is to build on this strategic advantage OII had of being in, anchored in the social sciences but to collaborate widely across the university with computer sciences and all the other fields relevant to the internet studies and also globally to, uh, to, be, to first develop high quality research and that that would be our, our entry point for re, uh, recognition at the university and also worldwide. So, we focused on a sort of a effort to build our global reputation for research in this area. And we, before we could hire people like Helen and others and, and, and Phil and uh, all the other incredible faculty and, and students we brought to the OII, we brought a number of visiting fellows and visiting faculty and temporary people, uh, Richard Rose, uh, Judy Wiseman, uh, Paul David, uh, the Ted Nelson and others. And we, we I mean, the, the attraction we had for really talented people with real personality, Yorick Wilkes joined us and he still helps us at the center, um, made it such a rewarding place to be. And everybody quickly realized that. And there was this, this atmosphere of, this is where people are looking at the uh, social shaping and implications of the internet in ways that could not be done in, a, in departments outside the social sciences. But uh, literally, I got, I got there in July, uh, Vicki, and, um, and the first thing I was told is the social science division doesn't know what this thing's going to do. Could you uh, present a strategic plan at the first meeting in September? And so, so I got quickly busy and I've been busy ever since. And uh, it's uh, just brilliant. I don't know if you saw the Guardian this morning, but the front page of the Guardian, they're having their 200th anniversary. But the, what's nice about it is they say, well, 200 years, but we've only just begun. And I just thought, well, that's triply true for us. We, we have 20 years, but we really have only just begun and, and you've just begun and congratulations on your, your position. But I'll, I'll get back Thank if you. there are other questions about, uh, about my strategy, <laughs> okay? Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, I mean, yes, you're right. Sort of the, the 200 years only just begun versus the 20 years only just begun. I think it is worth also just remembering that when we had our 10 year anniversary, 
you know, there were also some people making bets as to whether we would make it to 20. The idea being that, a bit as Andrew said, like the Telephone Institute, that, that the internet would just be so embedded in everyday life that you wouldn't need a separate apartment to study it. So, you know, again, it is it is just really interesting and really reassuring that 20 years on, there are still new questions, new challenges for us to look at. Um, Helen, maybe let's come to you on that point. So obviously you inherited this role after the first 10 years of the department. Um, so it's sort of consolidated, it's fixed within the university, it's a defining its field. What, what, what changed, do you think, during the period when you were director? You know, how did you see this area of research or OI work evolve? Thank you. Well, I mean, what, what happened during my period just couldn't have happened without those kind mm -hmm. of solid foundations that Andrew and Bill and, and, and um, Stephanie and everybody built. Um, it's not something that could have happened any earlier, but I, I guess what I felt most happy with when I when I stopped being director was the idea that the Oxford Internet Institute had proved that a certain kind of research was possible, which nobody had really proved before. And what I mean that is is research that crosses disciplinary boundaries, kind of all disciplinary boundaries, yet retains um, intellectual integrity. Um, I, I, I remember once one of my PhD supervisors sort of forbidding the word interdisciplinary from what we were talking about because he said that that just means no discipline at all. Um, and we got away from all that. We, we, we really showed that you can have genuinely multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary, whatever you want to call it, research that's, that, that's not only joining together or crossing the social sciences, but also goes outside the social sciences into um, the, the big kind of social science STEM divide and also into the humanities. And I think you can only think about this kind of massive social phenomenon that is the internet, if you've got that kind of um, you've got that kind of capacity in disciplinary perspectives um, that's led by the social sciences, and that is really important, as Bill Bill pointed out. There is plenty of it, a sort of multidisciplinary research that brings together different branches of mathematics or statistics and computer science and this kind of thing, or even individual social sciences. But something that's social science led that has that width of capability, I think is, is, is really very, very rare. Everyone talks about it. Everyone says they want it. The research council say they want it. Everybody says they want it, but it's really hard to do and it's really difficult to fund. So having that kind of new institution that could break the rules and do something um, completely different like that, um, I think was tremendously important. We had this uh, this year we've entered into for the third time the uh, the national research excellence framework um, mechanism exercise for funding university research. And once again, we've broken our record again, we've gone in under nine um, academic disciplines which cross all four faculties or divisions of the university and I do think that's something really to be proud of it's an exercise that's sort of almost designed as monodisciplinary and, and, and we cross those boundaries but I just end by saying one thing um, I this this was only possible because we had all sorts of people our brilliant faculty who were willing to sort of take a punt on this being possible. They all had their own disciplinary perspectives and their own um, areas of specialism. But, you know, it was a risky thing to do for everybody to say, I'm secure in my disciplinary base and my expertise and what I know about, and I'm going to go to the disciplinary boundary and do the most, and that's where the most exciting uh, research takes place. Um, so there was an element of, of risk. So if I look back over that time, I think I was director for seven years. Or, um, that's what I'm happiest about, that all those people, you know, took that risk. And that's why we have such brilliant faculty. Yes, and they're still with us now, which is definitely a sign of uh, confidence, I think. Phil, if I can turn to you. So you inherited the department, I think, at a very peculiar moment when the internet came into very sharp focus for government. So the sort of the, 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 sort of the policy context, if you like, in which we've operated over the last three or four years, I think is, is sort of quality different to what went before. How is that, how is that focus provided challenges and opportunities for the OII on, under your tenure? Well, I think it, it's meant that there's um, a pretty constant audience for almost everything we have to say. And I think this foundation 
that uh, Helen and Bill and Andrew built has really allowed us to remain, uh, globally speaking, the, the key place to play with unusual forms of data or play with data in unusual ways because the platforms are always changing and the, the technologies are changing and the use patterns, the cultures of use are always changing. And I think there's, there's several governments, especially around the commission and, and here in the UK, several government offices that have come to recognize the OII as the go-to place for the latest questions, latest advice on um, you know, the policy impl implications of all these technological innovations. Um, and the change is in a sort of a silly way, the change is constant, right? I think that's what's gonna keep the OII relevant for a long time. Would, I would completely agree with that. I think it's interesting that, um, and we might reflect on this more perhaps in the next bit of conversation. If I look back at the last 20 years, a lot has changed and actually a lot hasn't changed. So particularly, you know, in, in terms of policy debates, it seems to me that a lot of the sort of the same concerns, the same issues just come up in different guises again and again. And it certainly, as I say, this this concern that the OI wouldn't be relevant, that our research wouldn't matter. Mm -hmm. but to me, that becomes, you know, it's obviously much more unlikely, you know, every year as these questions arise anew. Right. Um, Maybe let's turn then to a question for, for, for any of you really that, that, that want to jump in. I mean, if we're talking about how the internet has changed over the last 20 years, you know, what, what and any of you on, answer this, what, what surprised you most or what have you been surprised about changing or not changing perhaps? So, you know, continuity and change over the last 20, 20 years. Were you pointing at me, Vicky? <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was, and I managed to hit something other than the mute button, unmute button. So yes, Bill. I, the uh, I, I, I want to just pick up on uh, Phil's comments and and so forth because I think the biggest change over the twenty years has been shifting sentiments about the internet. What is it? Mm -hmm. And you know, it was in two thousand two. It was still an interesting innovation, but some people thought it was a fad that was like CB radio, it's gonna go away. Uh, it, it took time for us to uh, get people to seriously look at it, but then it was like the, a gift to democracy. It was going to democratize the world. And, and then it was a gift to autocrats. It became a, a, a worry to this is going to be uh, in the hands of, uh, of uh, dictators and autocrats. This is going to be a, a empowering technology. and, and um, and then it was, it's nothing. It's like the telephone. It's why are we studying this? I mean, it became such a, you know, it's, everybody uses it. Why, what's so special about the internet? And, and then, it, then the disinformation concerns, the, uh, you know, uh, the destruction of truth, the, uh, the, after the uh, US presidential election and Brexit, we began to worry that the internet was ushering in disinformation and and now the uh, the pandemic where the internet is the lifeline of of education and and households neighborhoods and now I think that's this roller coaster has always been a part of the OII's existential <laughs> threats <laughs> like what well, how do we how do we respond to this? But what I find interesting about it is is this degree to which the internet itself has networked everyone around the world so much that we have these bandwagon effects of of sentiment, and it's like everyone thinks it's disinformation is the issue, or it's the lifeline, or it's a, a fad. So I, I anyway, this, as as Phil said, this is going to keep us. <laughs> We're going to keep on this roller coaster, but it will probably continue to be a roller coaster. It's not going to be viewed as a lifeline forever. We'll uh, have to, uh, uh, but anyway, I'll let someone else join in on this. Well, I would just flag up on that last point. I mean, again, it speaks to a lot of the research that you've done over the years, Bill, is obviously the, the renewed importance again of digital divides. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, lots of the debates, for example, around who was excluded in the early days of the pandemic, whether that be children not having access to, to digital resources for education, or as you say, you know, sort of families, individuals, you know, so very much excluded by the move to the virtual. Um, so yeah, so I think, you know, some of these themes retain their importance even over the two decades. They, they just sort of rise in a new guise. Um, any of you other three, any, anything else you'd sort of flag up as important changes or important things that have not changed? Helen. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I remember, I, I think it's the utter way that it's become sort of entwined with every aspect of, of, of our lives. I think Bill just said that as well. I remember the first time um, I came across my small son in the bath playing Club Penguin or something on his iPad in the bath, you know, and I thought I was horrified and I thought this is the end of civilization as we know it. But I mean, actually, there are so many exciting things about uh, uh, about that. Um, to me, it's the kind of the the accessibility of of all sorts of things because you can do little snatches of things, little bits of things, um, and and that that can actually be it can actually be a good a good thing. It can be it can be a positive thing. I'm sure we'll talk about the negatives as well. Um, but I remember when, and this goes very much to what Bill was saying, in, in 1999, I gave evidence before a parliamentary committee about um, the, the online participation, electronic participation, as it was called then. Um, and I gave an example of what I thought was interesting and where things were going. And the chair of the committee said to me, oh, if you're just going to talk about, you know, things like that, things you can do in your pajamas. Um, in a very, very dismissive way, as if this was just ridiculous, like nothing, like Bill said. But in fact, you know, things that you can do in your pyjamas have become so important, you know, because as, as it turns out, there's so many things that you, you can do in your pyjamas and, and or in the bath or whatever, you know, politics or, 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 or shopping or, 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 or learning or, or entertainment or socialising or keeping in touch, all these things that have been so crucial during the pandemic. So I know there are all sorts of problems, that's social issues and problems that stem from that. And, and I'm sure we might talk about those, but we shouldn't get away from that sort of exciting possibility of opening up all these things we can do at any time. No, I completely agree. And I won't ask him who's wearing pyjama trousers underneath their, their top half. Um, Phil. Yeah, fully, fully dressed here. Um, I just want to offer that, um, of course, on, on my shift, we hit the pandemic as an organization, and that forced a, a pretty significant um, pivot and how we teach and to some degree what we teach. But of the things that um, I, I think demonstrate how resilient the OI has become, I've really been impressed at how how much the global OII community has reconnected to um, to the OII through events like this. So the, the ties to alumni, the ties to policymakers who just want a casual encounter with the latest research um, have really driven up our, the, the numbers of engagements we get on social media and the attendance and events like that. And uh, I would certainly give it all back, but I do think we've, we've proven sort of resilient as a community in this way um, through events like this. No, I completely agree. And, and I find it very hard for, to imagine, for example, that we'd go back to just holding in-person events. I mean, those are brilliant for some purposes, but the idea that we can connect with our alumni, with our peers around the world, you know, in an hour a day is, is, is just so exciting. So yes, we have learned things that I think are a positive force for the good. Um, just a quick note to all those who are watching, don't forget that you can type questions into the Q&A and in about 10 minutes I will open those up to our panel, so pop your question in there. I think you can also vote up, vote up other questions that you think are worth asking. Um, moving on perhaps just a little bit, to, so, so I think Helen you spoke a bit before about you know reflecting on how research was changing and, and both you, you, know, you and all the panellists have emphasised the importance of social science research. But I just wondered if any of you wanted to say a bit about the impact of, of what we might call sort of computational social science or the move to using, you know, digital traces or, or, or big data to conduct research about these sort of big social science questions. How important has that been, do you think, in, in, in the sort of research impacts that OI has had over the last, the last 10 years? Anybody? Nobody, nobody has to answer if they don't want to. Helen, go on then. Sorry, I, I didn't want to stop someone else um, jumping in. Um, well, of course, that, I, I, I mean, I, I do think that that's also something that started under my watch and I have always believed is a, an incredibly exciting thing that the OAI has, was early to recognise the importance of. I mean, the transformative potential of large scale data for social science um, was huge. Um, we were kind of a bit late to the party. Um, it, you know, all the initial hype was around um, uh, business, but um, we're, we're, we're kind of there now. And I think it is a really important development for research about the internet. I don't see how you can 
um, uh, I'm a huge believer in qualitative methods and I use them a lot myself, but I, I, I wouldn't think that you could research um, internet-based phenomena without also um, considering the kinds of data that might be available and what you're going to do with them. Um, so it's a key area for innovation. It's a key area for capacity building. Um, it's a difficult area, you know, it's a difficult area to appoint new, new um, faculty in. There's a tremendous need. And this applies to policymakers as well, um, because it is changing the way that policymakers can make decisions. Um, if, you, if you think about the classic barbarian bureaucracy, all the data, all the information is completely unusable. It's all locked up in files, paper files. And then when first we computerized and we got digital government, then it was the same really, it was locked up in databases, but we couldn't use transactional data to drive decisions and, and design policy interventions. And now there is the possibility of doing that in social science, um, computational social science should play a big role there. So yeah, I mean, I think there's really exciting um, possibilities. Uh, we're only at the foothills really of the kind of uh, policy transformation we might see going forward, um, but it's a key challenge for capacity building. We need to build capacity. Perhaps just picking up then on that last point, so I think Phil, it was under your watch that we introduced the uh, MSc in social data science, for example. So we have updated our own educational offerings. We now have two master's degrees. We have two DFL programs. I think we must have about 400 alumni. Um, we also started some adoption. as well no you can't hear me Andy Andrew I'll speak up um a bit of executive education in the last couple of years with a particular focus often on policy makers what what do you think we should be offering in the next 20 how should our educational offerings evolve should we be reaching out to sort of you know broader communities should we have more uh, open access material for, for sort of wider audiences should we do more exec ed or undergrads what, what should we be offering well, I think, I think epistemologically, the, the next big challenge for us is to work more and more with device level data. So data from which we can make behavioral inferences, but um, which itself isn't content. And for the moment, even our computational social science is mostly content driven, or the content is the substance of what, um, uh, you know, the, the substance of what we often seek to explain or what we use as fodder for explanations. I think there, the marketing sciences often play with that very behavioral data. Um, and in part, that's because that data is almost exclusively held by the social media firms, the big tech, tech giants themselves. And so I would say that the, the ideological campaign should be about getting data about public problems into public hands, where, where we're, we're part of the public, doing public interest research. And that that might mean developing curricula that that shifts the focus, the methodology focus from stats training, right? Everybody has to do a stats class to the basic computational training. Everybody has to be able to play at some basic level with um, computational. <laughs> ah, agreement in the audience. Yeah, that, that got the dogs excited. Um, so yeah, being able to play with more and more different kinds of data, device level data, I think is, um, that's the kind of program I think we could offer in the years ahead. No, I think that's a great, that's, that's a great suggestion actually, and, and certainly one that we need to be thinking about much, much more. We haven't done much on that yet at all. Andrew, you've got some thoughts as well. Um, well, I wanted to go back, um, both going backwards and looking forwards. Um, and going back to things that both Helen and Bill said um, about the, the OAI being embedded in the social sciences. And um, I want to pay a tribute to a few people. First of all, one of the reasons why Dame Stephanie got excited about the OAI right from the beginning was because she had a background in computer science herself, but she wanted somebody to study the impact of the internet on society. It was the social implications that really interested her. So I think she deserves credit for having seen that that would be a very important part. But the intellectually interesting question to me is this, and I think it is, and I don't want to blow my own trumpet, I think we did get this right at the beginning. And I think if we ever feel we're going wrong, we should go back to this. Um, most disciplines, in a, this is a big generalization, but most disciplines are what I call centrifugal. 
um, you start with a few assumptions and then you work outwards towards the edges of them. You know, if you're a physicist, you start with the conservation of energy and then just go on more and more companies. E economics, maximization of utility, and on you go. And if you take problems, they're centrifugal. Any problem, whether it's migration or the pandemic or whatever you want to think of, you've got to bring in data, economists, lawyers, scientists. You've got to bring the disciplines together. And I think that one of the things that we got right in the OII was no discipline capture. That was absolutely crucial. And although we were in the social sciences, we were not allowed, I refused to have us embedded in any other department. And I think that that was, I had seen too many people, you know, trying to do work that straddled politics and economics and being crucified by the economics examiners in their DPhil if they'd had some politics or crucified by the politics examiners if they had the other sort. And so it was crucial that the OII was, was a standalone department, not captured by a discipline, but bringing them together. And I think if we ever lose our way, going back to being, and I think it was very interesting what Phil's saying, the way that the policy is becoming more important. I think if you're focusing on policy or going outwards, but you're also inevitably centrifugal, bringing the disciplines together. And I think that's just a core part of what the OII is about. No, I would completely agree with that. And actually, it's worth also just thanking you, Andrew, for the role that you had in making the OI full department. I think that that showed incredible foresight from reading your history. I believe it took quite a few people in the university by surprise. Um, no, they didn't like you know, it. They didn't like it. Uh, but you, was, you know, by there doing- was a long, There's quite an amusing, there was a, even result of doing the research into the history. I discovered battles I didn't, it, even I didn't know had been going on between the vice chancellor and various people trying to get us packaged off and put under some other department. And luckily I'd persuaded the vice chancellor that we shouldn't do that and he held his position. Yeah, I know having that independence has been so crucial to, to who we've become, both in being able to offer our own degree programs, as you say, fighting our own, you know, for space in the research, in the research area with the disciplines we want to use, not the ones that are imposed on it. So I do think that showed incredible foresight. On this theme, I want to start taking some questions from the audience, and there's, there's one here from Paul Timmers. Um, I'll read it out so that it, it'll appear in the recording later. He says, Will, with your experience um, of interdisciplinary research, what in your view is now the front line of interdisciplinarity, and what really hard challenges do we run into in OI's domain? Anybody want to respond to that? Vicky, I could, I'd like to because this, this question that Paul asks is builds on what Andrew said. Um, when, you know, in the early days, the challenge was the legitimacy of the social sciences in this space. And uh, we have established the legitimacy of the social sciences, looking at social implications and so forth. When I, I, I was educated as a political scientist and for two decades doing research in this area, political scientists would say, this is not political science, <laughs> you, should, you know, uh, whatever. So I took that, we was published in specialized journals, so forth. Now it totally turned around. Every discipline has Im embedded the internet studies in, in its discipline. So political science has their own journals on the internet and the internet studies and geography does all the various disciplines have uh, uh, adopted internet, the internet and internet studies. And now we have that risk of, of fragmenting the field in a way that, that undermines multidisciplinary from a different direction. Instead of not including the social sciences, we disciplinize this everything and, and we fail to collaborate in a multi, as, as Andrew said, there's no interesting problem that can be attacked from a single disciplinary perspective. I mean, uh, uh, discuss. <laughs> yeah, no, I would agree. I mean, if I look at the, the most exciting research going on with my colleagues at the moment, um, you know, we have projects around, for example, uh, how you govern the internet, which bring together philosophers and lawyers, for example, and social scientists or even computational scientists. Um, you know, we have geographers and sociologists working hand in hand. So. <coughs> it's definitely enabling us to do the sort of research that provides meaningful answers to some of these really complex questions. Mm -hmm. um, does anybody else want to sort of chip in? Helen. 
Yeah, I, I wanted to just bring in a quick illustration of, 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 of um, another side of the coin, if you like. I mean, I'm doing a, a lot of work on um, hate speech and other online harms at the moment. And one of the things I've noticed in that area, particularly hate speech, I mean, there has been a lot of research, but it's very engineering dominated. And um, the, the I'm not saying important research hasn't hasn't been done. But when you do it without any social science, then, 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 then you end up in a sort of normative vacuum, if you like. And a couple of years ago, I was giving a presentation at a computational social science conference. It was giving a, a, a keynote speech. And one of the people in the audience um, was questioning what I was saying about the classification, the machine learning classification of hate speech. And he said, yes, yes, but to do that, you have to you have to decide or you have to define what is hate. And, and that's a normative question. And he said it like I just dumped a, a barrel of rotting dead fish on the lectern. Um, and, you know, what was I doing? And I think that we have got to get over that barrier. Paul asked, you know, what's the biggest barrier? And that is a really important barrier to make this, what is in many ways a very technical field of sort of, I don't know, detection and, um, and classification and so on um, and see how much it needs as, as, as social scientists we are happy with the idea of, 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 of what is democracy and how you define it or what is um, a hate and so on and um, we have got to uh, we've got to approach multidisciplinarity from that perspective as well um, because there's lots of lots of people who need us um, and don't realize it yet thank you for that all right, uh, let's move on to another question. Um, there's a really great one here, but it's quite a difficult question, um, an anonymous, anonymous asker. What assumptions does the era of big data assume, in particular on the part of citizens? Unionization is happening in companies like Google. There's black critical race scholarship, challenging data coloniality. How are we gonna to respond to this? So if data is the new gold, where does this leave social scientists into big data? How do we do this ethically what types of social contract do we need to, to, to engage in with data providers? So, you know, internet users, how can we, how can we conduct ethical research in this field in the future? Nobody's, nobody's rushing to answer that one. <laughs> so actually Helen, before you come in, so I will mention for example, so we have over the years, for example, haven't we've talked about the possibility of having things like online uh, internet observatories and so on, whereby individuals would be able to voluntarily contribute their data for participation in social science research in the same way, for example, that individuals can contribute to medical research through um, activities like the biobank. Um, so that's one example of how actually there are different ethical models uh, that rely solely on voluntary contributions. Um, but I know also we have very significant uh, procedures of ethical review, which which are not only uh, well well sort of fixed, if you like, within the social sciences, but perhaps also at the edges, almost bleed out into computer sciences that don't have a big history uh, of doing that sort of work. So it is something we are grappling with. But yes, does anybody else want to add anything on any of this, Bill? Well, just to say, I just want to toot our horn a bit because before the word big data was ever invented, we were doing research on the ethics of computational social science and computational science. We were, had one of the first grants from the ESRC to look at the ethical, legal, uh, human rights issues and so forth around uh, the, uh, computational social science or what then became called big data. So I think, you know, when thinking about the future, it's, it's important not to basically follow what the current issues are, but we really always have to figure out how do we get ahead of it. Uh, and I think we were ahead of it, but, and that's why, you know, work by Helen and Phil and others, the OII has been, you know, really brought forward that field of big data studies. And because the OII was already aware of these kinds of ethical and legal issues. And of course it is a core part of some of our teaching. So if you look mm -hmm. at some of the courses within the two MSc degrees, um, uh, you know, two or three of those now spend quite a bit of time wrangling with uh, ethical uses of data, um, critical data studies, inequities in, in, in provision of data and uses of data. So, you know, I think you're right. I think we are at the forefront of the field, but I think we would also recognize that there is more good academic work to be done you know, on, on how we approach this. Okay, I'm gonna move on to another question that's coming in thick and fast. Um, there's a couple about the future and the milestones of the future, but I'm gonna to come to those at the very end, I think. 
Um, there's one very specific one here for Phil, uh, Grace Redfern. Professor Howard, could you share a bit about what made you want to start your computational propaganda research in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic? Thank you. Yeah, have, happy to offer a quick thought on that. It was um, most immediately the crisis in front of us, right? I think for several years we had um, successfully demonstrated what the Russian government can do, can su successfully demonstrated what um, uh, white supremacists in our own countries can do, uh, hard right and, and extremists can do with social media when it comes to producing this, this computational propaganda. But um, COVID is clearly, this situation is clearly one in which misinformation leads to um, having people take risks with their health in ways that uh, have consequences for themselves and for everybody else, right? It's, it, it, um, among the most clearest connections between public, you know, misunderstanding or public understanding of, uh, of a policy issue and um, fatal consequences. And we always get these questions like Bill, we always get these questions, um, you know, how do you demonstrate your cause? What's the clear outcome? The political scientists want to know how many voters have changed their mind, or they want to know which executive branches of government have changed because of something that the uh, happened online and we, we never got close to those kinds of answers but this this covid covid is it's a public health crisis that's worth addressing and methodologically i think it's um it's got a lot of interesting features that, that just make it a, a vital thing to spend time on yeah i mean it's been so incredibly prescient i think that you know one of the one of the sort of biggest challenges in the way of presumably has been constantly updating your research agenda as, as events in the world take shape around us. I mean, really are doing internet research and policy research in real time, uh, which Andrew, I remember, takes us back to some of the initial challenges you set for the OI, which was to, to sort of learn about the internet almost faster than the world turned. I'm gonna move on to uh, a question which hopefully will be of relevance to all of you. So I know we've got at least a couple of political scientists, well, yeah, a couple of political scientists on the panel. You've all worked with governments in various forms. Helen, this is your sort of bread and butter. Um, Nora says, uh, I'm sorry, Nora, much as uh, you're a friend of mine, I realize I don't know how to pronounce your surname, Nora Neil Um, Many thanks to the panelists for this fascinating discussion. Could you tell us what would be the view of the panel on how the internet has changed traditional modes of governance and policy making? Andrew, do you want to reflect on that first? Seeing as you were on the inside as an advisor for, for many years, how, how have you observed? I'm not normally quiet, Vicky, um, but I think on this occasion, I really do feel that my knowledge of government is too far back. I mean, I can just, the one thing that I can see um, is, I mean, it has spun out of the social media, the explosion of the social media, which I certainly didn't anticipate, and the the always on phenomenon. And I mean, when I saw senior politicians in the past, they were super stressed already. I cannot even imagine what it's like now, unable to keep up second by second with some a new message coming through. So. I think that the, the, the internet and the, the technologies that have gone with it have increased the pressure on people at the heads of all organizations beyond all imagining. That's the only thing I would say about that. No, I mean, that, that is the one thing I think you definitely are allowed to say, having been in that particular position and thinking about the pressures that it would bring, um, definitely. Um, Bill, do you mind if I go to Helen next, actually? Um, mm -hmm. I'm very aware that Helen, obviously, this is something you've been researching for a very long time. Um, without giving me the whole of you, all of your recent research findings, you know, what would be the top line results? What would be the top line findings on this question? Don't worry, Vicky. Um, I, think, I think a key thing um, is it forces, uh, forces government to innovate. Um, I mean, I, I think the big challenge of the internet in particular, you know, in a whole succession of technologies that have come into government, is it's the first technology that citizens were using, domesticating, innovating with, sort of generating um, things with um, faster than governments. In the early days of technology and government, governments were the leaders. Um, you know, the, the post office, can you believe it, built the first digital programmable computer, which was later used at Dich uh, Bletchley Park. And, and then look at what followed that after the recent scandal, uh, it was highlighted by the recent scandal. But the internet, it was something that citizens were, were kind of driving the agenda. Um, 
And that was a real challenge for government from which it's only really just emerging. But what we did see during the pandemic was we saw, you know, whole tranches of public services sort of move online in a hurry, not always successfully, but, and, and there's all sorts of issues around kind of digital inequality driving inequality per se. But at the same time, it did illustrate in very exciting ways um, how it, you know, the public sector can innovate when it, when it has to. And I think it's really important that we kind of capitalize upon that um, going forward. No, I agree. And you know, being able to tell that sort of positive side of what it enables government to do and how, how it enables it to change is really important instead of just focusing on, you know, large IT failures and things like that. Bill, you know, obviously you've also written a lot on this subject and you wrote some really quite, you know, early books on the use of computers in government. Would you agree with Helen? You know, or would you, would you sort of highlight some different, different um, top level features? Well, I mean, I, I, I totally agree with what Helen and Andrew have said, but I, what I want to have, you, you've set me up here for the fifth estate, which is, Look, uh, the, yes, uh, as Helen said, the internet is changing the way in which governmental institutions do what they do and how they do it and, and with what effect. But it's also created a whole new organizational form, a collectivity of networked individuals who have been empowered informationally and communicatively so that their communicational and informational power is greater than they would be if they had not been networked. And, and this sort of the fifth estate, I call it, is, is actually not part of normal governmental institutions. And, it, and, it's, and it's really affecting how governmental institutions operate, but it's, it's really outside of the uh, sort of current focus of most governmental research. And so it's, anyway, it's, but it's changing governance. It's accountability, the transparency of what's going on, people being filmed on the street uh, uh, or making arrests or uh, Greta, uh, one, one protester changing the world and the way we think about climate. This is amazing. And, and it's, uh, so we have to incorporate the fifth estate in terms of uh, other considerations of governance, I think. So no, I do agree. I mean, if I think about some of the very early work we did at OII, you know, in nearly till 2003, 2004 onwards, there was some quite, you know, really quite basic stuff now on things like, you know, e-consultations, the idea that you could email a comment on a regulation in the US or e-democracy, very limited opportunities for engagement, direct engagement with representatives. Mm. But, you know, it certainly didn't, I think, sort of foresee what we have now, which is this incredibly rich and sort of deeply mm. faceted, constant engagement and also citizen driven and led engagement with, with government policymakers, which, which we've seen. So it is a dramatic change, I think. Mm. Okay, we're approaching the last six minutes. So I'm gonna uh, go to each of you in turn, starting with Phil, because I think you might've thought about this most recently. Um, there are a couple of questions from, from our attendees asking, what is the next 10 years gonna, gonna offer? So you can either tell me what you think we're gonna be researching. So what'll be the sort of biggest research topics, or you might choose to focus on what particular milestones might be for OI over the next 10 years. But Phil, I'm assuming you've had to at least think about this a couple of times in the last few years. So over to you right. first. Well, I think, um, I mean, you're right, because my head's been in it for the last, most recently for the last few years, most of my thinking is around finances. And so I think um, we've had some good successes um, deepening and stabilizing the finances for the department. And I think that um, doing more of that work for the years ahead will be very important, right? Because that's what, that's what makes um, things permanent and stable and creative within a university. Um, Ahead, yeah, working with device data is the thing that I um, is the thing that I'm trying to evangelize and figuring out how to redirect some of that flow that just ends up in Silicon Valley, that flow of, of um, information that we don't have access to. Figuring out how to tap into that is going to be the big the big challenge. I'd completely agree with that last point. I think being able to unlock access, ethical access to, to industry data and finding partnerships that enable us to do that, I think that would be really revolutionary. Uh, in our research. Um, Phil, thank you for that. Helen, let's move on to you maybe. I think I'll go to that, I'll go to that point I made before about the kind of post-pandemic, hopefully, um, although of course it isn't, and, and, and the question of, um, of, of inequality and how the internet can play a role in overcoming um, 
sort of meeting the challenge of inequality that always follows major shocks and crises. Um, uh, I'm, as you mentioned, doing a lot of work at the Turing Institute at the moment on, on kind of policy making responses to the um, uh, uh, pandemic. And I think this will be the key challenge for the next 10, 20 years. And I think the internet can really play a role here. We, we, it is incredible the way it stood up to the crisis. We all complain about Zoom, but we shouldn't, um, <laughs> you know, because it's so exciting what we've been able to do. And going forward, you know, the question of identifying all the inequalities that have emerged and where digital inequality has been a mediating factor um, and, and, and how to mitigate that, I think that that's going to be a very rich agenda going forward. Here, here. Thank you for that. Bill, to you next. Yes, I, I think while we're all focused on the pandemic and dealing with just life in uh, every day, the, this online harms bill is moving ahead. And I think this is a huge train wreck uh, that we can predict right now. And I think it's going to totally un, uh, um, push uh, the platforms into over-censoring and, and uh, uh, over-surveilling the public in ways that are really, under, really threaten an open global internet or even, even a fragmented internet as we, we may be developing. So I think we've got to focus much more attention on internet governance and regulation in the coming years, because it, I think it's a real disaster on the horizon. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. I mean, I, I don't really get to answer this question, but I think if I had to identify one of the things I'd like to achieve over the next 10 years, it would be finding ways of, of gathering you know, good data to answer some of the questions about harms uh, and ensure that those are fed into policy making processes. I think there's still a bit of a lacuna because of some of the problems we mentioned earlier around not having access, for example, to things like industry data. Um, but yes, if OII can spend, can continue to do great rigorous research that also helps answer so key policy questions and helps us advise against bad policies, I, I would feel that was a job well done. Andrew, you get the last word on this. What are the next 10 years holding for OII? You're on mute. What I was saying was phew, a trivial question to answer in two and a half minutes or half a minute or something. Um, let me say, first of all, I agree completely with Helen that the big issue around for the world, the OII is so, the OII and the internet are inevitably now wound up in global phenomenon so that you've got to think always what is the, the really big issues. And the really big issues are the massive inequality, which has not stopped getting worse and worse, the possible decline of internationalization at a time when the internet is unlikely to do that. I mean, manufacturing is going to get much more local as people are trying to source locally, et cetera. So, and, uh, and, then, and because the inequality generated rising incomes, but not spread equally, there's a push pressure get back against internationalization and the, the internet's gonna be in the middle of that. The big tech companies are gonna get bigger and bigger. And I think the real issue to be thought about, and I have one thought on it is um, the technological determinism, people feeling that the way the data is coming, it has to be like this. There is no other choice. And I think that the, you know we are luckily all operating in a university and all the time we have to be trying to unpack for people what they can choose and what they can't choose, what they can decide and what they can't decide. And that the future of the world is not given. It's the point of universities is to in, in analyze these things and think about these things and then get back to the normative questions. Helen was exactly right. That's what makes this all worth doing. The final thought I would leave is, I was, always been quite struck about the extent to which the only way we seem to approach things that are not going right is to regulate. I'm much, much keener on having other sources which are doing the right things being a positive influence. I mean, okay, the BBC is in big trouble, but for a long time, British television was high quality because you had a, a public service broadcaster that was not owned by the state and it was influencing the other channels just by its presence. 
And when we first created the OII, one of the things we wanted to have was trusted sources. And I think we've somehow got to keep building those. Universities are those, museums are those, big charities are those. There are ways of building back a sense of a society which doesn't have to be regulating, but creating the bodies which can be where you are truth telling, not fake lies. Andrew, that's a superb note to finish on. And it gives me the most sort of incredible reminder about the responsibilities I hold as an ex-director um, and the importance of ensuring that OI contributes to be, as you say, a sort of a trusted, reliable voice uh, and contributor to the public good around the internet. So thank you for, for helping us finish on that note. We have reached six o'clock. Uh, and so I would like to end really by thanking, first of all, obviously our, our excellent panelists and with that, you know, it, feels, it feels wrong to thank you as panelists because the key thing is we're really thanking you for being past directors of the OII and getting us to where we are now. Um, and in the same vein, I, you know, I would love to thank others who might be on the call who were so uh, instrumental in our founding, so Dame Stephanie, uh, I don't know, I don't think Richard Siskin is with us, um, Derek Wyatt, Colin Lucas, Andrew and others. Um, again, it's been the most wonderful ride over the last 20 years and I'd very much like to host the ROI for the next 20. Thanks everybody for watching and contributing uh, and have a good evening. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for your time and considerable expertise panel. It's, uh, it's very appreciated. Um, and it was just fascinating to hear both the history and the future of the department. So thank you all for attending as well, and you'll receive a follow up email in due course. So the OII are hosting our next webinar on the 12th of May at one o'clock UK time, where Professor Philip Howe will be in conversation with Dr. Christopher Erickson on the empirical investigations of platform creativity. Please visit the events page on the OII website to sign up. Thank you again, everyone, and have a wonderful day.